coming up on Market to Market. Mother Nature delivers a one-two weather punch. Congress works to unravel a patchwork of GMO labeling laws. And farmers face new rules on antibiotics in feed. Those stories and market analysis with Darren Newsom next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, February 26th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The tightening of more than a few purse strings continued this week. According to the conference board, consumer confidence fell five and a half points to 92.2 on fears of deteriorating financial and labor markets. Those fears may have contributed to decreased new home sales. Commerce Department data revealed a plunge of 9.2 percent last month despite lower mortgage rates. But there are hints that consumers are opening their wallets. Orders for durable goods rose nearly 5 percent in January. When big-ticket items like airplanes are excluded, durable goods increased 1.8 percent, the best showing since mid-2014. Recent modest improvements in the economy are being mirrored by the weather. Patterns indicating spring is not far off have brought relief to some parts of the country. However, even though only three weeks separate the seasons, winter is far from over. Storm systems pushed tornadoes across the south and east this week, while heavy snow snarled travel in the Midwest. Two dozen tornadoes ripped through Louisiana, Florida, and Virginia, killing a total of nine people in the spree. One of the hardest hit locations was this RV park in Convent, Louisiana. Two people died and 31 were injured. In Waverly, Virginia, three people died when a tornado struck Wednesday night and at least five structures were damaged. And a tornado with an estimated two-mile path damaged homes and apartments in Pensacola, Florida. Heavy snow blanketed the Midwest and East Coast in a band that ran from Illinois to Maine. 1,100 flights were canceled between Chicago's two airports, and 74 mile per hour winds knocked out power for over 70,000 people in Connecticut as the storm moved through New England. Since the mid 90s, environmental activist groups have pushed for labeling of products containing genetically modified organisms. Early efforts included colorful protests with many participants dressed as monarch butterflies. Today, you're more likely to see labeling advocates in business suits walking the halls of local legislatures. Their work has helped move policy through more than one state house. However, the powerful food lobby sees no benefit to the practice and have taken their arguments directly to Congress. Josh Bittner reports. This week, the Senate Agriculture Committee delayed markup of a draft bill that would invalidate individual state rules mandating labels on foods with genetically modified ingredients. If passed, state laws would be replaced by a voluntary federal standard. Current state labeling issues include a number of varying exemptions, loopholes. And the move comes after a similar bill passed the House of Representatives last summer and months before a GMO labeling measure is set to take effect in Vermont. Maine and Connecticut have already passed GMO labeling laws that come into play only after neighboring states follow suit. But if internal legal challenges from the food industry fail, a Vermont bill will become the nation's first enforceable GMO labeling law on July 1st. What we've seen is that consumers all over the country are interested in knowing what's in their food and they're interested to know if GMOs is a part of it. And that's not necessarily either good or bad in the eyes of many, but it's just something they want to know. Monsanto, the National Corn Growers Association, the National Association of Wheat Growers, and the Grocery Manufacturers Association, among others, rallied behind the Senate proposal. Industry officials say 75 to 80 percent of all processed foods contain genetically modified ingredients, and new labels would confuse consumers. 
while compliance with a patchwork of state laws will drive up the price of food. The majority of U.S. corn and soybean crops are grown using genetically modified seeds. Much of the yield goes to animal feed, while a fraction is made into popular processed food ingredients like high fructose corn syrup, corn starch, and soybean oil. The Food and Drug Administration says GMOs are safe. Critics maintain not enough is known about health risks, claiming over 90% of consumers and at least one farm group support mandatory labeling. The National Farmers Union broke ranks with several commodity groups this week, opposing the Senate legislation in its current form. Ahead of the Green Mountain State's July implementation, congressional lawmakers will work to craft a law the Department of Agriculture will oversee. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. In the course of your daily life, you are exposed to various forms of bacteria. Some are beneficial, while others can make you violently ill. Antibiotics are often the key to relieving any discomfort. But in recent years, some of those bacteria have become resistant to treatment. One area receiving close scrutiny is the use of antibiotics in animal feed. In an attempt to slow the potential growth of resistant bacteria in animals that might cross to humans, the federal government has stepped in. Colleen Bradford Krantz explains. Livestock producers, veterinarians, and feed companies are preparing for federal rule changes that will alter decades-old practices some farmers have used for treating sick animals. The Food and Drug Administration's new livestock antibiotics regulations are also intended, however, to reduce the use of certain medicines solely for growth promotion. Experts hope that reducing antibiotic use in livestock could help or certainly not hurt in the battle against antibiotic resistance in humans. Uh, most of the experts would say they can't prove that um, uh, there's a definitive link between that. But I think there's enough concern by all involved to say, let's take a look at our antibiotic usage and look to see how we can use it a little bit more judiciously. Antimicrobial resistance, where certain microorganisms are no longer killed or adequately weakened through drug treatment, can occur naturally. However, the more humans or other animals use antibiotics, the greater the odds more surviving bacteria are resistant. The issue centers on how bacterial infections are passed between humans and animals or within the human population. Current laws already ban antibiotic residue in meat through mandatory treatment protocols. And according to the Centers for Disease Control, proper preparation of meat kills resistant bacteria. The problem is, is that you know, the, the loss of the current drugs is outpacing uh, the development in, of, of new products that are coming in. The CDC, in one of its recent reports, estimates that, um, you know, on the order of, of 2 million illnesses occur each year and 23,000 deaths each year associated with resistant bacterial infections. Scientists are still trying to ascertain how much antibiotic use in animals might contribute to the problem of resistance compared to overuse or misuse in humans. Regardless, several veterinarians and farmers believe there is little harm in controlling use of those medicines deemed important for human health. No regulation is all good in my mind, but I think there are good things about it. I think it's important as a producer to have a good relationship with your veterinarian. You've got to take the cowboy hat off once in a while and realize you're a producer of beef. You're not just a cowboy. The livestock industry worked voluntarily with the Food and Drug Administration on the antibiotic rule changes, which go into effect in January of 2017. The rules will limit the use of antibiotics considered medically important to humans. Farmers will contact veterinarians about sick animals to request a VFD, or veterinary feed directive allowing them to use the key antibiotics in food, water, or by injection. Traditionally, many farmers have independently treated sick animals. They are very significant changes to how, how these drugs have been used for, for many, many years. The practice of using antibiotics for weight gain seemed to gain steam in the 1970s, but recent government surveys suggest the practice may be falling off. However, the percentage of farmers who said they don't know or declined to report use for growth promotion increased. 
And while a recent FDA report shows that more antimicrobial drugs were sold for the livestock and pet industries in 2014 compared to the previous year, it doesn't indicate how much was used nor for what species. It's also unclear whether the 2014 outbreak of porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, or PED, could have explained all or part of that increase as hog farmers tried to treat secondary infections in thousands of piglets. Mike Briggs, whose grandfather started the family's Seward, Nebraska-based Briggs Feed Yard in 1935, says he knows of few, if any, current-day cattle producers who use antibiotics in feed solely for weight gain. I think for medicinal purposes, it's important. You can have an illness going around out in the pen, and if you can go out there and put antibiotic in the feed, then you can treat that whole pen and shut that down. Whereas to constantly keep going out there and physically pulling an animal, bringing them into the animal hospital, and treating them one at a time, it just it's, can be a swirling mess. Briggs already has weekly consultations with Seward-based veterinarian Dr. Ronald Wallman. As a result, the biggest change for the 10,000 head capacity feed yard might be dealing with more paperwork. There are a lot of reasons for doing this. One is, cons one is consumer confidence. A lot of consumers believe that that's an issue. If that's what they're asking us to do and that's what they would like to pay for, then I think we should do that. Dr. Reed Atkins, vice president of International Nutrition, an Omaha-based feed ingredient manufacturer, wonders if focusing on overuse of antibiotics by humans worldwide may have been a better strategy. Resistance uh, to compounds in humans will continue just like it is continuing in Europe and other parts of the world. The uh, livestock producer will continue to raise livestock. Possibly it will cost him a little more. Possibly there will be animals that don't receive a treatment that they might need. The Natural Resources Defense Council, which has made antibiotic use in livestock one of its key issues, believes animals should be treated individually and only if they are clearly ill. What we have right now is a situation where livestock producers can essentially continue to use antibiotics in a routine, prophylactic fashion and just call it by a different name. They can just call it disease prevention instead of growth promotion and continue with business as usual. The biggest impact may be on smaller scale livestock producers. Scott Cecil, a fourth generation farmer in Bee, Nebraska, has only 30 sows. He understands illness in hogs enough that he treats them himself, trying to use as few antibiotics as possible. Next year, he'll have to pay for a veterinarian to visit when his animals are sick. Sounds like to me it's going to become a uh, veterinarian pharmacy, and uh, I really don't uh, know if it's good or bad at this time. It's going to be very, very time consuming. The final impact on livestock producers remains to be seen as the puzzle pieces for implementation and enforcement are put into place. According to the FDA, operators like Cecil and Briggs will have a grace period in which to comply with the new rules. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. News from the Agricultural Outlook Forum and good weather in South America did little to boost the grain markets. For the week, May wheat lost 14 and a half cents, while the nearby corn contract fell a dime. Despite the report containing a potentially bullish outlook for soybeans, the May contract fell 17 cents. March meal saw the same news and fell 540 per ton. In the softs, the March cotton contract lost just over $2 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, April Class 3 milk futures lost 33 cents. In the livestock sector, the April cattle contract rose 305, April feeders increased $4.22, and the April lean hog contract climbed $1.95. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 1.5%. The April crude oil contract finished the week a dollar and three cents higher per barrel. Comex Gold lost 10.40 per ounce, 
And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained almost six points to settle at 299.55. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Darren Newsom. Darren, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. It has been an exciting week. USDA's Agricultural Outlook Forum has been going on all week, mm -hmm. and you are one of our most prominent <laughs> USDA skeptics. So have you tuned in much to these numbers coming out of uh, USDA? You know, I've, I've been traveling for most of this week, uh, doing a lot of doing presentations, uh, market outlooks to, to different groups. You know, this is the time of year for that. So I caught enough for our folks that were covering it in Washington uh, to see the headlines. Okay. And, and that was really all I came away with, you know, uh, uh, on, on Wednesday, uh, excuse me, on Thursday, I uh, saw, uh, saw the headlines were talking about the acreage numbers. Uh, and then on Friday, uh, you know, they, they re, uh, the full tables were released, uh, you know, giving us total production and stocks and all these sorts of things. And so, you know, uh, this particular set of numbers are what they are. I mean, they come out in February. There's a lot of changes that are going to make, uh, going to be made. Did they, did they really light a fire one way or the other underneath these markets? No, they didn't. Um, did it add to the pressure, as you, as you said in the opening? Absolutely. The I mean, sentiment has carried forward. It's just that there's, there's nothing bullish out there right now. Now there were some bullish, possibly some bullish numbers in these, uh, you know, that we could look at, but by and large. Uh, markets just continue to sink. And that being said, we saw wheat drop 14 and a half cents in the nearby. And we've got a question from Tim in Crookston, Minnesota. He sent this in to us on Twitter. We encourage all of you to do the same. He's wondering, with your thoughts on the projected planting acres, he's curious, will wheat really lose that many acres? Sure. I think it easily could. Um, you know, again, we, we, we took these acres away from wheat. Uh, hard red, all, all the classes saw wheat losses. Uh, but what did we do? We went down. I mean, we rallied at the end of the week, but it wasn't enough to erase early week losses. So, you know, maybe, maybe over time we can start to stabilize this market, but we went to new contract lows. Uh, there, really, the wheat's a factor of there's too much in the world, for right. one thing. Domestic stocks are huge. Domestic ending stocks to use are huge. And the U.S. dollar index just continues to go up. We can't sell it. We can't give it away at this point. Nobody wants it. And that being said, you mentioned new contract lows. From a chart perspective, mm -hmm. technically, what does that open us up for here for a new range? Well, in wheat, I've got to be honest, I haven't gone back and looked at the monthly charts yet, but uh, really it just opens a trap door. Going to new lows, actually, it, it seems counterintuitive, but it actually invites more selling to come into the market because there's really no fear that this thing's going to stop anytime soon. Uh, you got the dollar going up, as you said, over a full percentage point uh, in one week's time. Uh, you've got other commodities still struggling. Wheat has such a bearish supply and demand situation right now. There's no fear in selling you know, any of the three classes that trade at this point. Now, what hasn't seen contract lows, at least not this week, was the corn market. Mm -hmm. We saw it step back almost a dime uh, here in the nearbys. Where are we looking at from here? What is, what's your sense tell you as we walk into planting season? Well, most would say that I have no sense whatsoever, <laughs> but besides <laughs> that, corn is basically the crude oil of the green world. We have huge supplies, you should say huge ending stocks, um, we have demand that is disappointing. We're looking at supposedly year-to-year -year demand that is less, uh, that's coming down. And as of the numbers that we saw this week, we're going to push acreage back up to 90 million or plus. So Mother Nature plays nice. Uh, we hit trend line yield or better again for fourth year in a row. And what are we going to do with all the corn? Uh, you know, is We've got corn in this long-term sideways trend, and long-term sideways pattern. Recently, at least over the last year, year and a half, that's been between roughly 350 and 380. Mm -hmm. We break through the low side of that, and now you just flip that. We're looking at a target possibly down around the old October 14, 2014 lows, down 315, 320. All right. Do you sell that new crop here, or do you wait and hope for a planting scare and well, mark it then? I think our, our one chance is to get some sort of planting delay rally. Okay. Uh, and it's possible that we could see a wet spring. The way this winter has set up these storms, as you were talking about, moving through the eastern corn belt, uh, everything is getting real soggy. All right. And spring has come early, ground is thawed. 
So I think there's a chance that we could see some planning delays this spring. That's going to give us an opportunity. You know, we're running around the 380, 85 mark in Deese Corn. It's possible to get it up into low fours, 420, maybe a little higher. You're going to have to jump on it at that point. All right. If we get a planting delay, we're planting into wet soils, we're mudding things in this spring, can soybeans get a bounce on it or is the, the bearish sentiment just too overwhelming? Well, supposedly we're not going to plant as many soybeans uh, early on last December. Uh, we were think we were talking about a two million acre increase in soybeans. Um, this report, you know, this uh, these, this set of numbers comes out, and uh, we're actually supposed to see less acreage now. So, is that going to make a huge difference? We got 25.6 percent ending stocks to use globally. We have. Supposedly, Brazil still raising 100 million metric tons, Argentina 58 and a half. I think both those numbers are a little bit in doubt, Argentina more so than, than Brazil. You know, I don't see us trimming soybean acres anymore. Okay. But, you know, the same planting scare, plant, if, let's see, say planting delays that, that could possibly spark a rally in corn could also do it in soybeans. It's just that it's going to be very difficult to roll these, these, uh, these boulders uphill. All right. Well, let's take a look at the livestock markets because we do have a little bit of green ink in that sector of the ag world. We saw fat cattle, live cattle climb a little over $3 mm -hmm. this week. Is that a trend that we can see continue? I, I actually, and this is crazy, and we've talked about it before. You know, if you go back 10 years and talk about charts in the livestock, people walk out of the room. Uh, but on the charts, I think the best sector going right now is actually livestock. If you look at all three, uh, three major markets, uh, live cattle look like they're trying to run. They really need to get above this 138, 139 area, and I think they've got a lot of room on top of that. Uh, feeder cattle, likewise, they've been in kind of a bit. They've been a bit of a stalemate here lately, uh, but they look pretty good on their chart. And, and, and lean hogs have moved to new highs, extending their long-term uptrend. So all three of them look pretty good. And, and unless you know, we, we could always see a short-term downturn, but we're getting into that time of year. Uh, folks are firing up their grill early because, again, you know, Punxsutawney Phil told us we were going to have an early spring, and it seems to be coming around. Everyone's getting excited to grill. Demand's going to start picking up. So we're seeing the cash market provide some support. We're finally seeing some buying coming back into this market. Livestock actually look pretty good. All right. So on the, the live cattle, do you expect to see in the next week or two testing that 138, 139, or is this going to be a longer term uh, push up? I would say, you know, here we are at the end of the month, and that's on the long term monthly chart. So I'm going to say, you know, if not, it's not going to happen probably by the end of February. But, you know, let's say we, we get into, say, mid-March, something like that we could possibly be testing that area and then seeing if we can't break through. And this is still using the April as the most active contract or the front month contract. Okay. So, you know, I, I think we've got a good chance of at least uh, by mid April, excuse me, by mid March uh, testing that level. Okay. And if we see them run up and test, at mm -hmm. least then we'll see if we can hold or beat it. Where would that pull feeders up to? You know, the feeders got a, a little bit larger gap. We're looking at somewhere, not gap, but the area that we're targeting, and that'd be the, like, between 165, 175. Uh, but again, they flattened out a little bit. Uh, but if you get corn coming down, and at least over the next two, three weeks, that could continue, and, and you got cattle going up, live cattle going up, I think that could provide some support to the feeder market. Okay, so watch, that's a big area of support resistance to keep an eye on. Yeah, that, and that's really just a, that's just an upside target area, you know. So I, I think we've got some room, and I think it's got, I think it, I think it has enough momentum at this point. Uh, or at least can rebuild the momentum that it's had to, to start attacking that area. Now, as you talk about momentum, we saw this week start off pretty hot in mm -hmm. all the livestock markets, mm -hmm. particularly the cattle side, mm -hmm. and then it seemed like they were really mm -hmm. fighting towards the end of the week. Is that maybe a sign of weakness coming in? <sighs> to me, we're seeing that more and more week in and week out, where you know they build up this market real quick, and all of a sudden we see all this trade come in early in the futures market, and then those who have been in the markets more than the last you know, two years with trading the futures who actually are tied to the cash, they wait to see what happens in the cash. And that seems to cool things off a little bit, even though we are seeing stronger cash markets here, uh, in, in, you know, particularly in the live cattle markets, but in hogs as well. So, you know, that to me is the biggest reason why we, we see so much excitement early, these you know, three, four dollar moves in the futures, and then we kind of sit back and wait to see what actually develops in the cash markets. Okay, now you touched on the live hogs. Cash has been really driving that market. Mm -hmm. New contract highs you mentioned. Mm -hmm. This is quite a turnaround from three months ago. Mm -hmm. 
What is your upside target here for pricing in the lean hog market? You know, Mike, I did pretty good remembering two of the prices <laughs> that I was going to talk about. Um, I'm thinking it's going to get up into the upper 70s. Now, don't hold me to that. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at my chart, but I looked at it you know, a little bit this afternoon. Really like the pattern that we've got on the monthly chart. It looks like we could get these things back up into the upper 70s, the hog market back up. Put into another the upper 6 to $8 maybe on yeah, the Yeah, on this initial run, on this initial run. Longer term, who knows? But in this initial run, I think we can. Longer term, are you worried about a step back here in lean hogs? We did open quite a big downside there in November. You know, if we're, we're talking monthly chart, so this is going to take, you know, years to play out okay. on the five wave uptrend, three wave downtrend. So we may be nearing the peak of the initial run. And then, yes, we would pull back a little bit. But I think the market itself is looking better long term. So we may be talking another year or two down the road before we're actually talking about the peak in the market. All right. Now, Darren, you've talked about the dollar from a chart perspective. Mm -hmm. How is the dollar index sitting in here today? Um, I've got a few simple rules that I follow uh, when it comes to analyzing markets and looking at markets. And rule number four is simply market that can't go down won't go down. And technically, the dollar has looked like it should go down. We get news from the Fed that it's not, you know, it probably isn't going to raise interest rates for the rest of 2016. We'll find that out in March. But then something happens. In the case of this week, it was Britain threatening to leave the European Union. Euro crashes, dollar, dollar and the dollar index goes back up. So we've got a double top up there around 100.5, 100.4, mm -hmm. something like that. If we move through that, 108, 110, okay. something like that. If we don't, we could still see this same fight playing on for months. All right. Well, Darren Newsom, thanks so much for joining us this week. Thank you, Mike. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but Darren and I will continue our discussion and answer more of your questions during Market Plus, which you can find on our website. And while you're there, check out our social media feeds. You can join us on Facebook at IPTV Market or follow us via our Twitter handle at Market to Market. And join us again when we'll examine how the Apple industry has blossomed beyond its three staple varieties. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.